Good morning, my dear students. Good morning. Uh, in the study of ecology, or what is called as an environmental biology, I have completed one lecture, and that was on the organism. So, how an individual organism is living in this world is what we saw. How it is related to the biotic factors. How it is related to the abiotic factors. These were some of the areas we were concentrating in that lecture. Today, our perspective is going to be a little bit different. Organisms as a population, how they are living. So it's a totally a different concept. See, when you are as an individual, you behave differently. But when you become one of the component of your population, your behavior will be totally different. Okay. So, this is what the psychologists are called as a mass psychology. Your individual psychology will be totally different from your mass psychology. When you go and join along with the mass, you are carried away by the mass. Your individuality is lost. Something like that. See, when a plant is living as an individual plant in a particular area, you study that as a plant, individual plant. But when it is a forming a population, it becomes totally a different. Its behavior, its adjustment with the other plants, animals, a human being, its interaction with its associates, all of them are totally different. And that forms a very, very important concept in biology and that is what is called as a population study. So, plants as a population is what we are going to study. As I will be explaining in my lecture, see, an individual plant may have a birth, a growth and a death. But a population cannot have it. A yeah, population can have only a birth rate and death rate. So, the concepts about the population is very different and we are going to learn a lot about that in our today's class. Good. What are the different attributes of the population? <clears throat> In nature, we rarely find isolated single individuals of any species. Majority of them live in groups in a well-defined geographical area, share or compete for similar resources, potentially interbred, <coughs> interbreed and thus constitute a population. So, a beautiful definition for population. So, what is a population? A group of well uh, organisms growing in a well defined geographical area. So, they have to share the geographical area. Then, they, they, they should share the resources. They should share the resources. They, most important characteristic feature is they are interbreeding. Interbreeding is the third character. So, a number of organisms living in a particular geographical area, sharing all their needs and interbreed and then produce the progeny to form a population. So, if all these uh, things are met with, then you can call that group of organisms as a population. So, it has to satisfy the three needs. It has to be in a well-defined geographical area, sharing all its resources, reproducing in a beautiful way. So, these are all the qualifications. Although the term interbreeding implies sexual reproduction, a group of individuals resulting from asexual reproduction, also called as a population, 
for the purpose of ecological studies. <clears throat> for the analysis of the species concept in taxonomy, there the uh, I mean, uh, definition is uh, totally different. So, a, a particular word will have a different meaning in different connotations. Similarly, in ecological studies, when you are going to define what a population is, then you have to take sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction in equal way. So, whether a plant is a reproducing by a sexual method or asexual method, it will form a population. Okay? And that definition holds good for both type of reproductions. The attributes of a population, I am continuing. A population has a certain attributes that an individual system doesn't have. A individual, an individual may have birth and death, as I was remarking in my open lecture, open lecture but it will not have a birth rate and death rate. A population, in population, these rates refer to per capita births and deaths respectively. The rates hence are expressed in change in number, increase or decrease with respect of numbers of the population. Normally, uh, when you go to other parameters, it's always mentioned in percentage. Anything you call in percentage. But a population normally we say one out of thousand. That's normally because anything which out of hundred will be very very less and will be ongoing for unnecessary decimals. For example, how many clean filter syndromes are there in a popul human population? How many people are affected by cancer? What is the rate of what is the amount of uh, I mean the, the, the number of persons affected by tuberculosis in a particular area in a human population? If you are going to express all these things, the number out of 100 will be very, very less. So normally, in population, population studies, particularly for human being, the number will be always expressed out of 1000. Because you see the, the, the number of Klein filter syndrome may be 7 or a Turner syndrome will be 6 or 5, like that. So everything is expressed out of 1000 for the human population. So, it is expressed as a number um, out of a thousand. Normally, for the human population, I have to. <coughs> Another attribute characteristic of a population is a sex ratio. An individual is either a male or a female, but a population has got no sex. A population is a male population or a female population, it's not like that, it has got only a sex ratio. Example, 60 percentage of the population are female and 40 percentage is male. Population size, more technically called a population density, is designated as a N. So, population density is always designated by the letter N. Okay? Need not necessarily be measured in numbers only. Although total number is generally the most appropriate measure of a population density, it is in some cases either meaningless or difficult to determine. It's a beautiful concept. Let us say in a particular area, <coughs> I consider the density of that uh, a particular population by number n. Okay. So, in a particular area, in a particular area, one ficus bengalensis a tree is there. It is, it is, it has a form of beautiful canopy. About uh, 500 people can come and stay under that tree. Such a beautiful big tree it is. You know, the biggest uh, ficus bengalensis is in Adayar. We call it as a popular uh, Adayar Alamaram. It extends to many acres, they say. And the number of the prop roots, they say it is a more than 700. You know the gigantity of the ficus bengalensis. So one tree is there. 
what the amount of oxygen that is given out the carbon dioxide that is consumed during the photosynthesis the amount of carbon dioxide released during uh, the respiration and in terms of all activities see what this is single um, ficus bengalensis a plant is uh, doing even 1 lakh grasses will not be able to do so the oxygen output carbon dioxide output the transpiration water output everything 1000 grass plants so what it is uh, doing one ficus plant will be able to do that so if i say in a particular area only one banyan tree is there in terms of all potentialities it is equal to 1000 grasses okay so the number is not of a much useful value what one ficus bengalensis is doing the same thing thousands and thousands of grasses are doing so if i am going to express a thousand grasses and only one ficus plant both are equal only so the number is always misleading <coughs> so the concept of a number in population studies is always misleading okay in an area if there are 200 parthenium plants but a single huge banyan tree with a large canopy stating that the population density of a banyan is low because it is only one relative to that of a parthenium because it is a 200 it amounts to the underestimating the enormous role of the banyan tree in that community population growth the size of a population for any species is not a static parameter it's a continuously changing it is a continuously changing parameter it's not a static it keeps on changing in time <clears throat> depending on various factors namely food availability predation pressure and adverse weather because of these three reasons the population is going on changing <clears throat> if the food availability is more more population will be there if it is less the population will become increase the food is a, a deciding factor food is the first deciding factor for the size of the population the food has to support the whole population otherwise they cannot survive then predation pressure say okay, for in the case of a grassland vegetation the number of cattle that are coming for grazing it is the most important factor if 100 cows are coming daily to feed on that grassland that grassland vegetation will be devastated reduced to zero within very short time and then adverse weather is also a very important thing so a particular population existing in an area is subjected for a continuous change uh, depending on these three factors namely food predation and weather population growth <coughs> it is depending on four important factors so a population will grow <coughs> because of their natality birth more mortality it is a negative factor when mortality is more birth I and mean, population growth is negative emigration a positive factor then emigration a negative factor so two positive factors or the two negative factors are more and more birth it's adding to the population more and more immigration to that area adding the population but when death is uh, taking place and emig emigration is uh, taking place it is a negativity for the population growth even though i have given four parameters for the size of the growth for the increase in the growth these two are really very important 
Only natality and mortality, they contribute to more. So in a particular area, there won't be that much of immigration or emigration. So immigration and emigration is very less. Perhaps it may uh, I mean, uh, contribute to nearly 0.1 percentage or 0.8. It is still lesser. It is still lesser. One out of a thousand people will migrate to a particular place. Out of a thousands and thousands and thousands of plants that you are having, one may be migrating to a particular area and one may get removed from that area. Okay. So these two factors are not that much important. Whereas these two factors are really contributing to the plant growth. Population interactions. <clears throat> there is no such a habitat with only a single species. Such a situation is even inconceivable. <clears throat> okay. So you, you can't imagine a particular area, you can't imagine a particular area with a single species. It is totally, it is impossible. I tell you it is impossible. It's not even next to impossible. It, it is impossible. See, when you take a you as an organism, you are not a single, you are not a single. You are able to accommodate billions and billions of bacteria within you. So, no single organism can exist in this nature. It's, a, it's a something a difficult. <clears throat> okay, you are, you, you are lodging, already you are lodging billions of bacteria on your surfaces, inside your body, etc. So, you, do, you don't live all alone in this world. Are you able to follow? So, for any species, the minimal requirement is at least more species which can which it can feed. Even a plant species which makes its own food needs soil microbes to break down the organic matter in soil and return the inorganic nutrients for the absorption. They depend on only other uh, agents for a population and the seed dispersal. So, the plant is always depending on the bees for population. It is depending on the other animals for a seed dispersal. And uh, we are, we, we uh, the human, the animals, the plants, we depend on the microbes for our life. So, no individual can exist uh, as a separate entity. Now, I am going to design my lecture based on these uh, six concepts. Mutualism, competition, predation, parasitism, commensalism, and amensalism. What these are all the different type of interactions. If you if you say if you take a two species, so once a species A and a species B, there are two species in an environment, species A and species B. Now the positive and the negative interaction, if when species A is living along with B, both of them may be benefited. Both A and B are benefited. This is called mutualism. <coughs> A may not get any benefit. A may not, A, 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 sorry. A may be at a loss. A may be at a loss. And a B may also be at a Both of them are suffering. Both of them are suffering because of this interaction. That goes by the term competition. There is a competition between the two and both of them are losing. Now, in an interaction, when species A is benefited, but B is losing, here both are benefited, both are lost. A is benefited and B is lost. It's called a predation. A is lost, so detrimental to A, but B is gaining. B is gaining. It's called a parasitism. Parasitism. Now, A is benefiting, but B no loss, no gain. But A is losing, and B is no loss, no, no loss or no gain. So, different probabilities, just like in mathematics, different probabilities of interaction I have designed. And then the biologists have given different name for the different interactions. There may be trialism, competition, predation, parasitism, commensalism and amensalism. So these are the different type of interactions that we come across in a plant population. Of course, the species A may be a plant, B may be an animal, A may be a human being, B may be an animal. Now, this is a biological studies. It holds good for anything in this world. 
So both of them, for example, uh, in this may be species A, animal. It, it is getting benefited. And uh, here the plant, uh, uh, you, you can't say it is a loss. It is, it, is a, it is neither a loss nor a gain. You can't say like that. But here you see predation. An animal is coming and eating a plant. So it is a benefit for the animal and it is a loss for the plant. So it is a predating, it is a depending. One animal is a depending on another animal. So this a dependency could be in any form. It could be a plant, it could be an animal, one could be a plant or another could be an animal, it could be in any way. That's how general terminologies we are using in ecology. Population interactions. Both the species benefit in mutualism and both uh, loss, both lose in uh, competition in their interactions with each other. <clears throat> in both parasitism and predation, only one species benefits either a parasite or a predator, respectively. And the interaction is uh, detrimental to the other species namely the host and prey respectively. So, in a parasitism, it is a loss to the host and in a predation, it is a loss to the prey. Okay? So, it is in that way the interaction has been marked. The interaction where one species is benefited and the other is neither benefited, nor harmed is called a commensalism. In commensalism, on the other hand, one species is harmed whereas the other is unaffected. In, in commensalism, <coughs> in predation, parasitism and commensalism, they share a common character. The interacting species will live closely together. First, we are going to take up one after another predation. <coughs> when certain exotic species are introduced into a geographical area, they become invasive and start spreading fast because the invaded land doesn't have its natural predator. <coughs> so, when a plant living is there, When a plant, a, a, these are all the plants living in a particular area. When a plant, these, are, these circles represent the plant. When these plants are forming a population, if it is not having, if it doesn't have a natural predator, there is nothing to destroy this. No animal is coming and grazing. No other plant is coming and destroying these plants. In these situations, the, this population will have no control or no detrimental. It will, be, it will grow very fast. When certain exotic species are introduced into a geographical area, they become invasive and start spreading fast because the invaded area doesn't have any predators. So this will grow very fast. This is what happened for when the prickly pear cactus, when introduced into Australia, in the early 1920s caused a havoc by spreading rapidly into millions of uh, hectares of this range land in Australia. Finally, the invasive cactus was brought under control only by after a cactus feeding predator which is, in the, which is a moth. So this moth is a feeding on the cactus. Only when this was introduced into a system, then this was brought under control. So, when cactus came into a new area in Australia, in range land, it spread very fast, very, very fast, because there is nothing to control it. So, people became much worried about that. So, what happened? They had to find, they had to find their predator, which will be keeping the cactus under the I mean, uh, control. So they had to find a moth. So some certain things has happened in our country also. Beautiful example. Water hyacinth you are having beautiful flowers. It was introduced into India because of its beauty. 
violet color flowers, that you will be able to see on all the ponds. It's a hydrophyte, water hyacinth, a cornea, botanical name. When it was introduced, people were fascinated by seeing that flower, but it became a menace to the whole human population. Anywhere, everywhere you see water, that water uh, source will be completely, totally covered with this water hyacinth. It becomes a nuisance. Government had to spend a lot, lot, lot to remove this water hyacinth. Then decomposing and then uh, dealing with this water hyacinth became a problem for the ecologists. Because there was nothing to control this water hyacinth or a cornea. But when it was introduced, it was a beautiful plant. So many, uh, I mean, examples I can quote like this. Some of the trees were introduced from uh, Australia and then acacias. And then when it was introduced, people were very happy. Then only people found out that it, it is uh, taking away a lot of water, ground water. It is consuming the maximum amount of ground water. Uh, and then water problem came to India. Of so many reasons, this is also one of the reasons. This is also one of the reasons. So like that, when a plant is introduced into a society for the first time, it will it will not have any predator for the first time. Then it will grow like zuriently, very beautifully it will grow. But if you want to control it, you have to introduce a predation, you have to introduce a predator. This is what the technique we are following in agriculture also. You have got a disease causing uh, insect, you have got a disease causing fungus, you have got a disease causing element that is, is causing a disease. Now, since it is not having a predator, it will flourish very much. It will cause the maximum amount of damage to the host plant. And if you want to keep this plant, this fungus, this disease causing element under control, you have to introduce a predator. You have to introduce a predator. In the olden days, we were using pesticides, insecticides. And we found out that these chemicals are highly detrimental to the human health. So now, biologically, we have to treat this. So what we are doing, we have to introduce a predator. That a predator will kill that insect which is causing the damage to the plant. So by introducing one insect into a system, you will be killing another insect which is causing a damage to the plant. So this is a technique of only we follow. This is a technique that we have learnt from the ecology in the uh, I mean, a disease control mechanism also. Biological control methods uh, adopted in agricultural pest control, this is what I was just explaining to you now, are based on the ability of the predator to regulate the prey population. Predators also help in maintaining species diversity in a community by reducing the intensity of a competition among competing prey species. <clears throat> for plants, herbivores are the main predators. For plants, herbivores, herbivores are animals, elephants, rabbits, rats, many, many times birds. The birds, they depend on the nuts and the fruits, and then uh, the, there are a category of uh, animals, particularly cattle, elephant and all, they depend only mostly on the plants. Okay, so for plants, the herbivores are the main predators. Nearly 25% of insects are known to be phytophagous. They depend only on the plants. The problem is a particularly severe for plants because unlike animals, they cannot run away from the predators, over plants, over plants. If a predator is a killing, if, uh, if, um, if a predator is, if a predator is preying on an animal, A cheetah wants to kill a tiger. Of course, there is a chance for the tiger to run away from that place. But at least a cheetah has to make an effort to kill a I mean, uh, deer. Or if one animal is uh, trying to eat a rabbit, 
if a tiger is uh, trying to kill a, a sheep or a cattle, just to make some effort. But in this case, poor plants, poor plants, they can't even run away from the place. So they become the prey very easily. So the problem is particularly severe for the plants, unlike animals. So plants therefore have evolved an astonishing variety of morphological and chemical differences against the herbivores. So morphological and chemical differences. Morphological differences, chemical differences. This is what I am going to explain in a detailed way now. What is the morphological differences? They produce a lot of uh, thorns and spines over their body that the animals uh, cannot uh, come and eat them very freely. Okay, it's uh, one of the beautiful mechanism. You could have wondered why God has uh, created the plants with so much of uh, thorns and uh, spines. Rose, the flowers are so beautiful but it is uh, full of thorns. Only since there are thorns you are not able to pluck the flowers. Otherwise, all the rose plants Completely you would have devastated by this time. Only because of a thorn and the prickle that it is having, you feel a little bit hesitated to go near the rose. So the spines and thorns, they are a beautiful defense mechanism for the plants. As I was telling you, when you are going near a rose plant, it cannot run away. Poor plants. Okay, they have got the defense mechanism by the chemical means also. When you just go and touch it, it will be producing itches. When an animal is going and eating the particular plant, it will develop a lot of features on the mouth. It will be high. It will, the many plants will be very sticky in nature. Very sticky in nature. How many plants are so beautiful plants are there? There is a plant called, you, you must have heard about a plant called a touching knot. The moment you touch it, it shrinks. And then, so the plant calls itself as a touch me knot. So there is another plant, a beautiful plant called, a, what is called as a kiss me knot. Kiss me knot. The moment you take a plant and then kiss, your whole face will become I mean, swollen because of uh, some type of allergic reaction that it is uh, having. So, when the uh, animal is uh, going and feeding that uh, plant, it will be having allergic reactions. So, some of the chemicals are able to produce uh, high allergic problems to the animals that they are scared of these uh, plants. They, they won't go near this uh, plant. They are sticky in nature. They produce a high amount of allergy and uh, the plants have got uh, so many different mechanisms like this uh, to safeguard themselves. But with, uh, thanks to the nature because it has given its own beautiful mechanisms to save my plants in this world. It's generally believed that a competition occurs when close related species uh, compete for the same resources that are limiting. But this is not entirely true. See, you think that the competition will occur only because of the closely related species because the demand will be the same. So, the plant, for, for example, you think that A and B are closely related plants. And a competition will always be there only between these two plants because the need of the A and the need of the B will be same. So, they will be having only a competition. Maybe under the impression like that. But it's not like always like that. The plant A and the plant C, they are totally different plants. Totally unrelated plants. But even then, there could be a competition between the two. Even though the need between the two plants is totally different. A beautiful example I am going to give it to you. For instance, in some shallow South American lakes visiting flamingos visiting flamingos resident and resident fishes they competed for their common food for zooplankton so this uh, zooplankton is being fed by two unrelated animals one is the flamingos which are coming they are visiting professors they are the migratory birds they migrate from some other area and then they come there temporarily. So they are visiting flamingos. These are visiting flamingos and are resident fishes. These fishes, they reside there itself. They are permanent residents there. They are temporary birds coming. Now these are two unrelated population. 
This is one part of the part. These are totally unrelated. But they have got a common need. So there could be a competition between the two unrelated population also. So it's not we, as we think that uh, the competition will be there always between the related species or uh, similar species. It's not like that. That concept is not correct. Okay. Now you understand. I am giving. I am explaining it with a beautiful example. Competition. I am continuing. <coughs> Secondly, resources need not be a limiting factor for competition. In interference competition. <coughs> The feeding efficiency of one species might be reduced due to the interfering, interfering and inhibitory presence of the other species even if resources are abundant. So even if resources are abundant, there could be a competition. There could be a competition. If uh, uh, the food is very much, the food is abundantly present. Don't think that the competition will not be there. No, even there, there will be a competition. Okay, even then there will be a competition. The feeding efficiency and the inhibitory interfering factors will be there to have a competition even when the food is abundant, even when the food and the space are abundant. Now I am going to another type of interaction, beautiful interaction called what is called as a parasite. In a parasitic mode of life, a free lodging and meals are given for a parasite. See, free boarding and lodging. Free boarding and lodging is provided by another plant for a parasite. And they are supplied, these are supplied to the parasite. So, it is not surprising that parasitism has evolved so many taxonomic groups from the plants to higher vertebrates. It's a common Phenomena both in plants and animals. Why, why, why in plants and animals? Even in human being, when a guest is coming to your home, he is he not a parasite on you? So in human being, a guest who is coming is a parasite. The, the house owner is called as a host. The house owner is a host and the man who is coming as a visitor is a parasite. I am very sorry, very, very sorry to use the word. If a guest is coming to your home, he remains there one or two days, beautiful, we host him very happily and then when he leaves the house, we give him some presentation and then we send him. But if the guest who is coming is staying there in your house for more than 10 or 15 days, is he not a parasite? Is he not a parasite? Is he a guest? No, I am not a prefer to use that. Here he is only a parasite. So he is coming and then staying with you, interfering in all your activities, unnecessarily poking his nose into your work, he has become a parasite. So this a parasitism is there in plants, animals, human, everywhere it is there. So when a plant is depending on another plant, it is getting a free boarding and lodging. So it lives happily there, doesn't bother what is happening to the host? Sometimes the host is totally killed because of the parasitism. The parasites are flourishing well and then the host is killed. Okay. So many parasites have evolved to be host specific. So it is a one is to one relationship. A particular parasite can live only on a particular host. Any parasite cannot live on any host. No. So very, it is a specific to a species level. It is a specific to a species level. A particular species, even even at a level of a sub subspecies, I am telling. A particular subspecies of a cascuta can only live on a particular species of an angiosperm. The relationship is so specific. So it is a host is specific in such a way that both host and parasites are tend to co-evolve. <coughs> If the host evolves a special mechanisms for rejecting or resisting the parasite, the parasite evolves a mechanisms to counteract and neutralize them in order to be successful with the same host species. See a beautiful concept in biology. If the host is trying to avoid reject a parasite, the parasite will find out new mechanisms. A parasite will find new mechanisms 
to counteract and neutralize the host. Just like that. The guest is coming to your house. He stays there for three or four days. Then you 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 give you, and so you are giving some reason and then asking him to go out. But he has got his own reasons to stay in your house. Who is going to him? I don't know. It all depend. It all depends on your efficiency. If you are, some guests are coming and then permanently they have decided to, I mean, uh, decide in your house, you have to reject them. If you are not able to reject them, they will be having their own reasons to stay there. So when a host is developing a mechanism to reject a parasite, the parasite has got its own adaptations to stay with the host. Similar thing we come across in the plant and the disease relationship also. Yeah, when, when, you, when a bacterium is coming and then attacking you to produce a disease, what you do? You take a medicine, you take a medicine to kill the bacteria. But what the bacteria is doing? The bacteria is developing a mechanism and it is developing a resistance for the medicine. So, you are trying to kill the bacteria by a medicine, but the bacteria is trying to neutralize the effect of the medicine. There is a very big competition between you and bacteria. If you are going to win, good. The bacteria are killed. The bacteria are going to win, win. You will go under the soil. You are going to, you will be under the soil. So it all depends upon who wins and who loses. Okay. But you, you understand. But there will be always a competition. There will be always a competition between a man and the virus, a man and the bacteria. A virus and the bacteria. Always there is a competition between the two. Who is going to win? Natural desires. Similarly here, a parasite is always a trying to be on your host. The host is a trying to reject. But the parasite is a developing its own mechanism to be with the host because uh, it cannot leave that host and then go away because otherwise the death will be the result for the parasite. So it will be developing its own mechanism to be with the host for the rest of its life. Okay. So this is what is a continuously happening in nature. I'm continuing in parasites. <clears throat> in accordance with their lifestyle, parasites evolve special adaptations. The loss of unnecessary sense organs. See, when a parasite is living on the host, so it is depending on the host for majority of its needs. So nearly 75% of, of its needs of food, everything is being taken care of by the host. Then why should it have some unnecessary organs? So the loss of sense organs, many, many parasites, they don't have eyes, they don't have ears. And the presence of aggressive organ, that is very important. An anim yeah, one animal has to, if it has to live on another animal, it has to cling to it very fast, very firmly. Okay, so some aggressive mechanism will be there with the help of the suckers, clinging. So these are all some of the very important concepts because it wants to keep itself uh, reminding the host. So attachment will be there. Loss of a digestive system. High reproductive capacity because the parasites always have so one of the most important characteristic feature of a uh, parasite because their life cycle becomes a very complex. Okay, so it becomes a very complex. It has to find uh, another suitable host until that time they cannot have a life. So because of that, their reproductive capacity will be more and they have a complex life cycle. So these are all some of the beautiful characteristic features of the Parasites. I'm continuing parasites. Parasites are divided into exoparasites and endoparasites. Okay, so they feed on the they on the external surface of the host organs called exoparasites. The most familiar examples of this group are the lice and the human. Beautiful example. I don't think that will there be any human being in this world whose head is not having a lice, at least one or two. And they say, in the, in the Indian population, there is no Indian who in whose stomach uh, at least a minimum one pair of Ascaris lumbary goddess is not there. It is a common thing for any Indian because of this uh, highly insanitary condition. 
highly polluted nature and the indian scenario indian situation is like that any indian is a bound to have at least a minimum one pair of ascaris lambricoides in his stomach of course we may not be knowing that when its number is very less we don't bother about it similarly i don't know whether there will be any indian whose head is not having any lice there are common ectoparasites very common ectoparasites then similarly the ticks on the tops many marine fishes are infested with uh, ectoparasites in many copepods parts. copepods parts are there on the marine animals marine fishes cascuta the parasitic plant that is a commonly found on growing hedge plants has lost its chlorophyll and leaves in the course of their evolution it derives its nutrition from the host plant which it parasitizes see I told you it is losing all its life activities it is having a very very convenient place to live then why should it work why should it work so it has lost its all its chlorophyll no no, no i want to work unnecessarily with the help of the sunlight with the carbon dioxide with the water and then photosynthesize store the starch why if when it is a prepared food is available at a cheaper rate why should you take the pain of preparing the food that's what a cascuta is thinking a very intelligent plant predation thorns are the most common morphological means of defense chemicals make the herbivores stick sick when they are eaten inhabit inhibit feeding or digestion disrupt its reproduction or even kill it the wide variety of chemical substances that we extract from plants on a commercial scale called a nicotine coffin quinine strychnine opium these are all the the uh, alkaloids secreted by the plants to safeguard themselves from the other animals see we are very intelligent we human being are very, very intelligent these alkaloids secreted by the plants to safeguard from their predators we take and then we make use of for our personal pleasure we take a coffee and we smoke and cut it we do everything but remember why the plants should be secrete all these things for the human being any plant is having any concern about the human being do the plants have got so much of concern about you no 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 the plants secrete all these things to safeguard themselves from their predators but you make use of the thing because the human intelligence is always there what the plants are having we make use of them and then we use it for our pleasure okay. like endoparasites are those that live inside the host body at different sites the lifestyle of endoparasites is more complex because of their extinct specialization their morphological and anatomical features are greatly simplified with them while emphasizing their reproductive potential so their morphological features their anatomical features their physiological features everything is very simple everything is simplified but what is more pronounced is reproductive potentiality they have got a very high amount of reproductive potentiality you know one thing very interesting information a pair of ascaris lambricoides which is living in your stomach or intestine of a human being if i told you a pair the pair means a male and a female the male and the female if it is living in your stomach the female is laying 40000 eggs per day 40000 eggs per day is a per day it is why why is so many number of eggs it has to lay because its life cycle is so complicated its life cycle is uh, only when it is laying so many eggs the eggs at least one out of this 40000 will find a reentry into another human being because their life cycle is very complicated so their reproductive system is very efficient a female worm is able to lay as i told you 40000 eggs with the help of a male when it is in your intestine you become a prey no how careful you should be now at least 
brood parasitism in birds is a fascinating example of a parasitism in which the parasitic bird lays its eggs in the nest of its host and lets the host to incubate them. See? How intelligent these are. animals are. A bird is laying the, its egg in the egg of another host and it is making that host to brood it. Okay? And for this purpose what it is doing you see during the course of evolution, the eggs of the parasitic bird have evolved to resemble the host egg in size and color to reduce the chances of the host bear detecting the foreign eggs and ejecting them out. See? The eggs of the parasite, the parasite, this is called a parasite, some say part of the parasite, some brute parasite, parasite. The egg of the parasite has been evolved in such a way that it looks exactly like the egg of the host so that the host body will not reject the egg of the parasite. Parasite means here the parasitism is not for the food or the lodging facilities, it is for the brooding purpose. It's called a brood parasitism. Common size, and this is an interaction in which one species gets the benefit and the other is uh, neither harmed nor benefited. An orchid growing as an epiphyte on a mango branch <coughs> and the barnacles growing on the back of your bird benefit while neither the mango tree nor the bird derives any apparent benefit. So here, the benefit, the other is a neither, one is a benefiter. Which is a benefiter? The, barang, the orchid is benefited by the mango tree. The barnacle is benefited, but the mango tree is not benefited and the bird is not benefited. Orchid is benefited, mango tree not benefited. Barnacle is benefited, bird is not benefited. One is a benefit, other is neither harmed nor benefited. This type of relationship is called common size. A beautiful example I have come in for that. The egrets always uh, forage close to the cattle because as they move, they sit up and flush out the insects that otherwise uh, might be difficult for the egrets to find and catch. See, beautiful. The egrets are always uh, on the close association with the cattle because the cattle will go and then uh, they will flush out all the worms and on these worms the uh, egrets will easily find out. Because it is difficult for the egrets to find the worms directly. But if they are sitting on the back of the cattle, then the job becomes very easy for them. Then, then they will be able to feed on the worms very easily. See animal that has a stinging tentacles and the clown fish that lives among them. The fish gets a protection from the predator which stay away from the stinging tentacles. The See, anemone doesn't appear to derive any benefit by hosting the prawn fish. So, there are beautiful examples in nature of commensalism. This mutualism, this interaction confers the benefits on both the interacting species. Like it is the most beautiful example for this uh, mutualism. It is, a, uh, it is a combination of an alga and a fungus. Alga or a fungus. In this alga may be a, a photosynthesizing alga or a cyanobacterium. So we have a beautiful association is giving rise to a separate plant called lichen. Mycorrhizal association is another very good example. Ectomycorrhizal association, endomycorrhizal association. You would have studied different type of mycorrhizal associations. These are all beautiful examples of a mutualism where both are equally benefited. See, the higher plant is benefited by the supply of nitrogen and the mycorrhizae, are the fungi are benefited because it is getting a free lodging. The most spectacular and evolutionarily fascinating examples of mutualism are found in plant-animal interrelationships. The plants need the help of the animals for pollinating their flowers and dispersing their seeds. Orchids show a bewildering diversity of floral patterns, many of which have evolved to attract the right pollinator insect, <coughs> that is uh, bees and uh, bumblebees, and ensure 
you have guaranteed a pollination right so here you have got the mutualism between the plant and the animal the animals become the pollinators and the, I mean, the plants are able to give the fruit the seeds etc what all the birds need the birds or the plant is able to give a perfect mutualism is existing between the two the mediterranean orchid uh, of fleece employs a sexual desire to get a pollination done by a species of a bee if the female bee's color patterns change even slightly for any reason during evolution pollination success will be reduced unless the orchid flower co-evolves to maintain the resemblance of its petal to the female bee this is a very good example of a court evolution these are all these are all i tell you these are all very 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 interesting things in nature if you want to really understand the nature you have to move with the nature see this point alone is a very beautiful point perhaps if i find some more time i will be able to explain all these things all very beautifully so in this bee what is happening in in a particular species of a bee the female bee sorry the orchid flower the orchid flower looks exactly like the female bee so the male bee goes and then sits over the flower thinking that it is a sitting over a female bee because the flower looks exactly like a female bee and then it is going on copulating beautiful videos are there just to go and see on this see and then finally it is uh, it doesn't understand that it is a, it is a pseudo copulation in fact this we call it a pseudo copulation it doesn't understand realize that it is a pseudo copulation but since the bee female the flower looks like a female bee it is uh, trying to copulate and in that process it is uh, doing a beautiful job of a pollination so the flower of the orchid by resembling that of the female species of a particular bee it is able to attract the male bees and then um, get the things done i think i will i will use the word like that it wants to get the things done so it is employing a particular method such a type of mutualism such a coevolution is existing in nature a very beautiful concept in biology i can talk a lot lot more and more about all these things because the nature is a very fascinating area for any biologist so these are all some of the areas which are very very interesting in nature good now that um, that and there i come end to this uh, very beautiful topic on uh, uh, ecosystem and in today's lecture i was able to tell you a very interesting aspect about the population how, why a plant cannot remain as an individual how it is associating itself with its uh, co members either it is a benefiting or a harming in different way how we have, i mean the population is existing in the nature that was my key point of a today's lecture uh, more interesting more fascinating and uh, more interesting things will be from me in the lectures that are going to follow thank you that's good fine nice